children and then have a surplus and feed the world. But it's our, right now our corrupt leadership and our inability to have you know, good financial management that's keeping us in, in the trenches. Okay. Now having lost your father to um, such a violent act, especially a man of peace, um, how did that affect your feelings towards your countrymen as well as your uh, country? Um, actually, that's the first time that question has been asked to me. <laughs> um, I actually decided that I was going to continue his dream. That, you know, Africa, I love Africa and especially my country. And I just was heartbroken to, you know, that such a, a man who, was, who had such love for a country would be killed that, you know, but that's what peacemakers do. They stand between opposing forces and are killed. So we knew, he knew going into it that this was a dangerous field of work, you know. And so when he died, I decided, well, when one soldier goes down, another one must stand up. So this is really what I'm trying to do is put a focus back on Africa and say we need to try and get along, you know, for the future of our country and our children. It's time to, you know, for the restoration generation to restore once again this nation back to its former dignity. You said, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, then I will heal from heaven and I will heal the land. I'm paraphrasing a little bit. How do you think you will get that message to be able to see in our lifetime the full and complete healing and restoration of the entire continent? Mm. The church. It's really the only option is to do it through the church because once we can break, you know, that my father's message to the church was how can we as a church go out there and speak about peace and reconciliation when we ourselves are so divided? And so really bringing that, I think it's a little easier sell to Africans than it is to Americans because we still, we, we really have a communal uh, heritage anyway. So it's easier to bring us into, into fellowship. Uh, the difficulty I'm having is here in America getting 10 pastors to break their territorial spirits and all the things. But, mm -hmm. um, you know, slowly that should happen too since that's God's vision, it's not mine. And he has to make it, <laughs> give the provision and make the way. But um, in Africa, it is dealing with the churches. And, and so far I've had really good reception. And uh, you know, especially also the youth are realizing that they they have to they're the ones who, st who start movements. They're the ones who create change, and so this they picking up on this restoration generation really really fast. And in fact, I get messages on Facebook. When are you coming back? We're still holding the torch for the restoration generation. You know, so but sometimes your mission field is not your comfort zone, and so you know God is like it's too easy for you in Africa. I need you here. You know, so I'm I'm working on putting that together here because. We're in, I mean, talk about crisis. This nation needs to really a reawakening in a, in a bad kind of way. You know, our children right now are dealing with issues that really what they were not me ever meant to, to deal with. You have two-year-olds who, you know, inadvertently playing with daddy's iPod can hit a wrong button and there's the most violent, vulgar filth in their face. We're losing our innocence faster and earlier than ever before. Nine-year-olds are waking up and popping Vicodins as a general, you know, we, we're raising a generation of you know, emotionally bankrupt human beings because they've been on medication all their lives or, you know, the six-year-olds, you know, seven-year-olds seeking help for pornography. What happened, you know? Listen to Chicago, black on black violence, young boys killing each other. For what? Just because somebody threw water at them or something like that. And, you know, on, on that aspect, you know, when we talk about why blacks are killing blacks, I think what's happening here on the streets of, of, of America is just transported tribalism. That's really all there is to it. So we need to really dig deep in our hearts and our soul and see how we can start to, to erase about the, the, that mentality and come together to unite and save our children. Okay. Let's talk about your other book, Journey to Healing. I know that's extremely personal. Tell us what really motivated you to actually write it down in a book and share it with the world. You know, I journal a lot. So when I was going through the bitter divorce, um, I kept journaling. That really kept me sane. And I was, and every so often, I, I would meet with the every week. We'd meet with the women's Bible study group, and I would share bits and pieces as as was you know necessary. And the ladies all said, "You've got to write that in the book. You've got to share those in the book because so many people are brokenhearted and need to hear those words because they're feeling that pain, but they don't know how to verbalize it." And so that's how it started from a Bible study group. I, the lady's saying, you need to put this in a book. And so then I did. And, and I think 
I think we're living in a world of such brokenheartedness. You know, it's called the age of discouragement or something. And uh, this is a book that is raw. It's not, you know, these journals are exactly what happened when I was going through it. So I, there's no mincing up words. It's exactly the pain. And that's what you need for to heal people. No, no nice little words put together. You need the hardcore truth of how it feels when you're in hell. <laughs> you know, and how you hold on to heaven while you go through that kind of hell. And so I'm hoping that it blesses and, and heals a lot of ladies and, and men. And anybody who's brokenhearted really can find. Okay. As a society or, or even a body of believers, um, sometimes we tend to be more caught up in the religion or in Christianity than we are in the reason for it being Christ. Mm -hmm. You are very much so a Christ-centered woman. Explaining to you in your words what that means to you and your mission of the Restoration Generation. You know, as I said in my speech, um, that I had to get to the bottom of who I was. You know, after I'd sought out every answer there was, I, I ended up with this one alternative, and that was Jesus. And when I said that name, Jesus, I was transformed. Same thing that happened to my father when he came to the Lord. He was an alcoholic and smoked and whatever. But when he came, handed his life over to Jesus, he was transformed. So I know there is transforming power in the blood and the name of Jesus. If it hadn't happened to me that way, maybe I wouldn't, you know. But I know for, you know, I don't know how he does it. I don't know what kind of power he uses. All I know is that it works. And if it worked in me, it will work in anybody else. And so we need to really, and, and you know, Christianity lived well, lived the way Christ intended it to be, is absolutely the most fasc fascinating thing you've ever seen, you know. But it's just that we don't do that. We don't live, we're so hypocritical. And funny thing is it's the Christians that are the most hard-hearted. And I'm just wondering what happened, you know. We have the gospel, the good news, but yet we're displaying such disunity and such sarcasm and you know especially what's going on now with the political climate you know it's the christians who are in the forefront of this of spreading hate and and i'm thinking that's not jesus's message you know we need to get back to the true message of jesus which is to love the, the lord your god with all your heart mind and soul and then love one another like yourself those two not abortion not gay rights no nothing those are not the issues the issues are to love your god and to love one another Thank you so much for sharing your time with us. We greatly appreciate it, you and the message that you gave. And we look forward to seeing whatever else you have um, for us in the future. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. And our day with the WFWP has come to a close. But here's a programming note. Look for our report on their Clean Slate program coming up on a future Newswire LA broadcast. In the meantime, this excited group of women are enjoying their kinship and the fact that they've made it an astounding 20 years. This group is looking forward to the next 20 years of service and peace. And that's it for this broadcast. We thank you for joining us here on Newswire LA. And remember to follow everything Newswire LA. Look us up on Facebook and Twitter at Newswire LA. We'll see you back here next time and good night. Stay tuned for more news on this Westlake Signal Station.